Part 1 Storybook Who can explain memory? At 82 years of age, Josie had forgotten so many things. Things worth remembering, and things best left unrecollected. She could still remember the wonder she felt as the Great East River Bridge began to rise like a stone leviathan from the river near the Brooklyn tenements of her early childhood. She knew that her family had crossed Panama on their way from New York to California, but of this journey, nothing had remained with her. However much she tried, and God how she had tried... Josie had never been able to make herself the proper mistress of what went missing and what came back, like an unwelcome visitor knocking at the door. Things which happened only ten or fifteen years ago were now already blurred in her life store of memories. Important things. She was sure of it. Yet, staring out upon the dry, cracked yard today from her chair on the sun-weathered porch... Josie's mind was pulled back like a whiplash to things from her girlhood. Not vague memories of long summer times past or the hazy outline of her mother's face. No, these were tiny, sharp-edged little crystals of memory. But they carried no worthy freight of lessons learned, friends lost or wisdom gained. They were no use at all except for cutting. Her life had turned out tolerably well, even happy at times, because she had placed these sharp little things in a locked trunk so very long ago, hoping to lose the key. She had kept walking, never once looking back where she had abandoned her memory chest, dumped and almost forgotten on some unnamed dusty roadside now far behind her. But still... Sometimes, Josie would turn suddenly, sensing a presence in the corner of her mind's eye, and it would be there again, waiting, unlocked, lid open. And then she would be thirteen again, white knuckles gripping a door strap, curled over and on the verge of being sick on the floor of a bouncing and swaying stagecoach. She was also on the verge of being 14, which meant a lot, because the sudden and attendant curves she carried on the outside were able to disguise the gawky schoolgirl still inside of her. Miss Hattie had spotted Josie as she walked past Miss Hattie's establishment on her way to school. Miss Hattie knew all about the things young girls like. Fine shoes and dresses. Being noticed travel, adventure. No one could make a promise look quite as promising as Miss Hattie. And besides, Josie was looking to be convinced of anything that could take her away from the stinking flatland tenements and school teachers far too fond of the rod. Two weeks later, and there she was on her way from San Francisco to Arizona Territory. The dress and petticoat she had been given to wear were nothing like what she had imagined, but still, it was a very grown-up dress. The shoes, though. Josie got up from her chair and turned from the relentless sun to go indoors for a cool drink. The shoes. Her 13-year-old, almost 14-year-old self, had been hoping for a pair of nice, lovely ankle boots with buttons down the side. Instead, she had been given some heeled slippers. Slippers which seemed very large. The old woman leaned her head for a moment against the doorframe, a mottled hand pressed to the screen door, and might have begun to cry if she had allowed it. Eighty-two years old, her man already fifteen years buried after forty years of high and not-so-high times together. Another world war carrying off all the young men. 
and here she stands, all alone in the end, alone outside her front door, and still seeing the pattern on the shoes which kept dropping off her feet onto the rattling stagecoach floor, and all because a little girl's legs were too short to reach that floor, and the grown-up lady's shoes were too big for her. Celia's breath had become less than a whisper, the rise and fall of her chest now imperceptible. The clunk of boots coming up the loose wooden saloon stairs seemed far, far away, miles away, years away. Her eyelids fluttered and closed, and the bottle fell from a limp hand hanging off the side of the bed rolling slowly a short distance before stopping in a small gap between the rough floor planks. Boots at the door. Door handle turning. Door swinging open, hitting the side of the wardrobe. Celia saw him standing there, tall, hat in one hand, mustache hiding his mouth. So handsome. Was he smiling? He was. Her man. Her protector. Come on, girl. Pack your things. We're heading out west with Jim and Bess. West? West where? Las Vegas. New Mexico Territory. We're going to hook up with some old friends of mine there and travel on down into the Arizona Territory. But why? Ain't Arizona still Indian country? You got work here. I quit yesterday. Word is there's big silver strikes all over Arizona. It won't be Indian country once everybody gets wind of the strikes. I intend on being there early. Go on, pack up. You want to die poor? I'll be waiting downstairs. Celia's eyes fluttered again, and he was gone. Like her brother Marion. Gone. Killed young by the consumption. Age 22. Like her older sister Maddie. Also taken young in her 20s. Like brother William. Dead at 21. Her father dead only a year after William. Not that her father had been a big loss to her. She gasped for breath, so tired, so tired. Where was she at all? Iowa? Kansas? Arizona? California? The heat was like a hot iron held to her face. Her eyes opened one last time, but it wasn't him standing there. It was three rough miners by the door, and the doctor leaning over her, ear placed sideways to listen for her breath, one hand on her neck, checking for her pulse. Always the whiskey on their breath, even the doctor. Rough boys and men, too ashamed, too scared and unschooled to ever dare look a woman in the eye, let alone touch a woman without the courage of drink. One man had once looked her in the eye and actually saw her, but in the end, even he had dumped her like a pair of worn-out boots, swapping her for a girl ten years younger. Her eyes fell closed, and the walnutty smell of burning mesquite carried into the room by a scorched and bone-dry July wind, relieving her at the end from the smell of sweat and whiskey. She saw her mother's dark eyes, clouded with reproach, sad, tired, and so, so disappointed, then fading, fading. Is she gone, Doc? Yep, she's gone, boys. The doctor picked up the bottle of laudanum from the bedside table, turning it over in his hand 
squinting at the label, and then glanced down at the empty gin bottle on the floor. I guess she killed herself. Can't say as I blame her, with the silver all played out in this shithole town. One of the miners slapped his hat against his leg, and a dust cloud billowed out, shot through with the evening sun angled from window to floor. Well, that's just a damn shame. Now there's only two blanket whores left and them's Indians. Damn it all to hell. I'm Brian Halpin. Welcome to the time before we were white. Episode 7 My Little Runaway. Part 2. Crossfade By the time they had reached Arizona Territory, both girls had changed their names. Josie, who was born Josephine Sarah Marcus, became Sadie. Celia, who was born Celia Ann Blaylock and known as Celie to her family, would now be known to friends and clientele as Maddie. There are a thousand and one reasons that can lead young girls into prostitution. The reasons for deciding to work under an alias are somewhat fewer. Covering one's tracks is an obvious reason for a person hiding their real identity. Family often came looking for runaway daughters. No one wanted a cowboy to point at the local bordello and say, Oh yeah, your daughter works over there. When such girls came into contact with the law, and they often did, having their real name plastered in local newspapers would also be unwelcome on many levels. But perhaps the biggest reason for a name change was the need to keep a tiny piece of something for oneself. It is one thing to accept money for physical intimacy, but to also have your real name in the whiskey-washed mouth of every John who stumbled upstairs from the saloon after midnight? Maybe some things are just beyond the ability of any young girl to bear. Celia ran away from her home on an Iowa farm, aged just 17 or 18, bringing her 15-year-old little sister Sarah with her. Some histories say the girls were looking for a life beyond the drudgery of a farm, Others whisper that their father was a little bit too strict and more than a little bit generous with corporal punishment. Maybe even worse things were meted out by Henry Blaylock. We will probably never know. Families keep secrets. Celia could sew, and maybe the plan was to make it as far as Kansas City or Fort Leavenworth, to look for work as maids, cooks, washerwomen, or seamstresses. The choices for young girls at the time were limited. Whatever their plans, things didn't work out. Within a year, Sarah had returned home to her parents' farm in Iowa, leaving Celia to face the world out west, all on her own. The years between 1868 and 1870 are blank, but by the age of 21... Celia had fetched up at Fort Scott, Kansas, on the Missouri-Kansas border, probably arriving via the new Kansas City, Fort Scott, and Gulf Railroad. By the age of 22, she was definitely working as a prostitute. Women in the trade were known at the time as sporting girls, painted ladies, 
soiled doves, and other such euphemisms, and Celia was certainly known to the authorities as one such person in Fort Scott. By 1876, at the age of 26, Celia had already pushed farther west to Dodge City, Kansas, where she soon struck up a relationship with a man also recently arrived there from Wichita, under something of a cloud, it is said, a town where he had divided his time between gambling, working as an official peace officer, and as unofficial muscle in his lady friend Sally Haskell's brothel. The same game which had worked so well in Wichita for a while was transferred to Dodge City, with Sally being replaced by Celia. Everybody in Dodge City knew Celia's new man was handy in a fight, so she was treated as well as might be expected by the Johns who visited her, even when her man was out of town chasing outlaws down to Texas or chasing easy money up in Dakota Territory. He always came back. And for a sporting girl in 1870s Kansas, having a man who always came back was something. So, of course, she made allowances for a lot of things and didn't mind all that much when he managed some of her money. And this is also why she agreed to follow him to Arizona. Johnny had been in Arizona a couple of years, prospecting, fighting off Apaches, running a sawmill, when he managed to get hired as an undersheriff in Yavapai County in 1866. This was pretty good going for a man of only 21 years. Handsome, black-eyed Johnny had a fondness for younger girls, and soon his dark eyes were fixed on his boss's 14-year-old stepdaughter, Victoria, who fell pregnant with her and Johnny's first child at the tender age of 15. Johnny did the right thing, or was made to do the right thing, and married Victoria shortly after. He was elected county recorder, a decent job with plenty of scope for someone with political ambitions. All was not domestic bliss, however, and within five years Johnny's roving eye was back roving, this time, his 29-year-old eye had landed upon another 14- or 15-year-old girl named Sadie. Sadie was accepting clients at a local brothel in Prescott, Arizona, and Johnny was soon spending much of his spare time and money in her company there. By 1875, with two children under the age of six and still only 22 years old herself, Victoria had had enough and divorced Johnny. Worse for Johnny, his Sadie had also had enough, and in early 1876 hightailed it back home to her parents in San Francisco to lick her wounds. Single again, Johnny bounced around various private and public jobs for the next few years, until 1879, when he decided to open a saloon in Tip Top, a boomtown near Prescott, Arizona. Mining town saloons needed more than whiskey and a piano player to be a success. So, Johnny headed north to San Francisco in 1880 to find Sadie, stroke Josie, with a mouthful of charm and a pocketful of promises that he would make her respectable by marriage if she would only come back to Arizona. And just like six years earlier... Josie was looking to be convinced of anything that could take her away from the stinking San Francisco tenements. Celia, now Maddie, suffered terrible migraines, probably exacerbated by a combination of years of emotional and physical stress, a life spent in smoke-filled rooms, irregular sleep, and her precipitous slide into alcoholism. And like so many girls in her position at the time, Maddie turned to laudanum for relief. Laudanum is a highly addictive tincture of opium, with effects not unlike heroin. Maddie's 
boyfriend and his brothers had done well in the move to Arizona, quickly finding work as stagecoach guards and officers of the law. Since their arrival in December of 1879, the town had grown from around 1,000 inhabitants to almost 10,000 in just over a year and a half. Dusty thoroughfare stank of horse shit, bustling with cowboys, Mexicans, half-breeds, Chinamen, and sundry ne'er-do-wells, who often propositioned her right on the street, not realizing that she was an honest girl now, with a protector. But while Maddie had been able to quit working the body houses, with no family to tend to, she was often awake into the early hours, drinking, and probably still sound asleep long after her man had left for the day. It seems fair to speculate that her life was becoming a lonely blur of days into nights and nights into days. That is, until one day in October of 1881, when the noise and bustle of the streets was suddenly broken by the crack and blast of shotguns and rifle fire and the snap-snap of pistol shots. By September 1880, Johnny Bean was no longer the day-to-day, hands-on manager of his saloon in Tip Top and had relocated south to the nearly lawless mining town of Tombstone. It is unclear whether he and Sadie had arranged to rendezvous there or had traveled there together. By February 1881, he had used every political connection made over the past 15 years in Arizona to get himself installed as the sheriff of newly formed Cochise County, and Sadie would now style herself as Mrs. Bean. But ever true to form, whenever Bean managed to maneuver himself into a promising position, he committed some act of self-sabotage, mainly due to his propensity for letting his hyperactive libido rule his brain. Johnny began taking other girls into his bed whenever Mrs. Bean was out of town. But on one occasion in the spring of 1881, Sadie came home earlier than expected and found black-eyed Johnny in bed with a mutual friend's wife. She kicked him unceremoniously out of the house for good. Such an act of gumption wouldn't have normally been possible for a woman moving in such a man's world, but the house in question had been built with money Johnny had bummed from Sadie's father back in San Francisco. So by the time the shooting started a few hundred yards up from the OK Corral one Wednesday in October, right beside Camillus Fly's photography gallery, Sadie was long past wanting anything more to do with Johnny Bean. But she probably didn't want to see him shot dead, either. Maybe Sadie ran out of Saul Israel's Union News Depot on 4th Street. Maybe she ran out of the Crystal Palace Saloon. Maybe she turned, worried, as she looked up at the window where Johnny Bean kept his office on the same floor as the city marshal's brother, a handsome and quiet man she had met regularly, just in passing, over the past year since arriving back in Tombstone a man by the name of Wyatt Earp. We'll likely never know. History is silent on the whereabouts of Josephine Sarah Sadie Marcus on the day of the gunfight at O.K. Corral. History is also silent on the exact time and way in which Sadie and Mr. Earp became lovers. Unless we trust Sadie's later recounting of events, or Hollywood's recounting of events. And there is very, very little reason indeed for trusting Sadie's, or Hollywood's, word on anything. A few things need to be crystal clear to anyone interested in the 19th century history of the American West. A place like Arizona during the mid to late 19th century should be understood as being something akin to a post-apocalyptic landscape, a place of outrageous environmental pillage and scarcely conceivable social turmoil. Arizona had been carved out of the earlier territory of New Mexico and Old California, both of which had been annexed from Mexico during the late 1840s and early 1850s by a blatantly warmongering and expansionist USA. This is excluding the Gadsden purchase of southern Arizona by the USA, and 
offer which the recently defeated Mexican government was in no position to refuse. To the still free and unsubdued Apache and other Arizona tribes like the Navajo, the Anglo-Americans who had begun traipsing through their land on their way to the California gold fields in 1849 were just one more problem on a list reaching back through the centuries to the arrival of the Spanish. But the thing which set these latest Anglo-Americans apart was their ruthless determination to extract wealth in the shortest time possible, whatever the collateral damage. Texas cattlemen moved in, and within 20 years Arizona saw its population of range cattle increase from less than 40,000 to over one and a half million, eventually causing massive environmental devastation through overgrazing. The sight of over three quarters of a million cattle killed by drought and starvation in one single season must have seemed like a scarcely imaginable hellscape. But it would be the discovery of massive silver deposits which would create a truly lawless free-for-all. Most have heard of the 1838-1839 Trail of Tears, in which native peoples including the Cherokee, Creek and Choctaw were force-marched from their homes east of the Mississippi River to less desirable lands in Oklahoma. Fewer are likely aware of the many land grabs made during the American Civil War. After all, war is a great time for robbing houses while everyone is away sandbagging the break in the levee. During the Civil War, American folk hero Kit Carson was in Arizona, murdering Navajo men, burning Navajo homes and crops, killing and driving off Navajo livestock, and destroying communal wells. Kit Carson's heroics would lead to the partial surrender and long walk of the Navajo, in which between eight and 10,000 men, women, and children were marched from their homes in northeastern Arizona to Bosque Redondo in New Mexico in 1864. When men like Johnny Bean arrived in Arizona in the 1860s, the territory had been scarcely 15 years under nominal USA control. The Apache were still raiding, Chinese immigrants were piling in as workers on railways, in mines and laundries, African Americans were working everywhere as cowboys, cooks, laborers, and indeed lawmen. And Mexicans, it was sort of their country after all, still vastly outnumbered Anglo-Americans. The most important Anglo-American settlement in Arizona in 1864 was the capital Prescott, a town so new it had precisely 40 females, of which 31 were Mexican. A town so new it could accommodate characters like Mary Sawyer, who seems to have been an apparently non-binary woman who worked her own mining claim and dressed, drank, and swore just like the men around her. A town so new that one of the few other white women there, a woman named Mary de Crow, had arrived with her black lover from Texas, a situation unthinkable in the eastern USA at the time. Not that the white men liked her relationship status, they just didn't have the critical mass of numbers nor enough of a functioning legal system to do much about it in those raw times. This is also why Johnny Bean managed to get himself beaten silly by a group of Chinese immigrants sick of the casual racism on display by the new white settlers. But Arizona's constitution soon forbade the testimony of Chinese, blacks, mulattoes, and Indians against any whites in court, so these much put-upon ethnic groups had little choice but to operate outside the law in defending their rights. This racism on the part of the incoming Anglo-Americans was widespread, loud, and aggressively unapologetic, and eventually did become fully steeped in violence. This was the environment in which men like Johnny Bean and the Earp brothers became designated lawmen. These frontier lawmen weren't trained in any police academy or sheriff school run by any state or federal government, nor were they required to pass any exams or demonstrate a firm grasp of the law. 
lawmen in frontier era America were little more than well paid mercenaries, hired, bankrolled, or controlled by whichever interest happened to hold sway at any given moment in any given region. A lawman might be paid openly or under the table by stagecoach companies, railroad companies, mining interests, local cattle barons, town committees, or groups of local businessmen. A lawman might be the appointed or elected tax collector in one county or another. This same lawman might then be paid indirectly through the county or state or territorial taxes he was charged with collecting. This was obviously a system ripe for plucking by corrupt groups and individuals. Even cities as big as Boston and New York back east had no professional full-time police forces until the late 1830s and 1840s. So in places like Arizona, prior history as a Confederate soldier, criminal, train robber, bandit or outlaw was no automatic impediment to becoming an officer of the law. In fact, such a background was often seen as making a man eminently more qualified for a job in law enforcement. Basically a poacher-turned-gamekeeper sort of thing. Wyatt Earp and other members of his family had clear and extensive histories of criminality and violence. Pimping, racketeering, horse theft, and later grifting, match-fixing, and claim-jumping. You name it. Wyatt's brother Warren was by all accounts such an ill-tempered, nasty piece of work that he got himself shot dead in his 40s. Earp's entire life was more or less one long chain of episodic drifting from town to town, looking for the next shot at easy money. Wearing a badge was just another easy money gig. But the one constant was always prostitution, and using violence or the threat of violence to profit from prostitution. From running a brothel on a floating gunboat in Illinois, age 24, to owning the Oyster Bar and Brothel in 1880s San Diego, or running a saloon and brothel in Alaska, aged 50. Women were always just another way to earn easy money, an income stream no better, no worse than being a gun for hire, or gambling. Again and again, when such a revised version of history is presented, apologists for men like Earp will say things like, he was a man operating within the norms of the time. Or, you can't judge people then by today's standards. There is a simple reply to this point of view. Earp was later mythologized precisely because he did not represent the norm. Most normal men were not violent mercenaries, vendettas, gamblers, or pimps. But 1920s Hollywood in its search for simple, universally popular, and thus bankable, stories of white heroism in the Wild West, was never going to dig too deep or offer up tales of moral ambiguity. Dime store novel readers and moviegoers wanted stories of gunslingers and white virtue, and folks looking for such stories have been well served, that's for sure. Law and Order 1932 Tombstone, the town too tough to die, 1942 My Darling Clementine, 1946 Gunfight at the OK Corral, 1957 Hour of the Gun, 1967 Doc, 1971 An American Tale, <laughs> Fievel Goes West, 1991 Tombstone, 1993. Wyatt Earp, 1994. Tombstone Rashomon, 2017. Even the venerable English sci-fi fantasy series, Doctor Who, got in on the act in 1966 with an episode called simply The Gunfighters. Amusingly, the Steven Spielberg-produced feature-length animated film Fievel Goes West stumbles upon some historical authenticity by introducing Eastern European Jewish characters to Sheriff Wiley Burp. Okay, they're cartoon mice, but still. 
a century of such storytelling, always centered entirely on the celebration of white male swagger, is why history requires some serious counterbalance sometimes. Shortly after the infamous gunfight in Tombstone, Earp's brother Morgan was assassinated in an apparent revenge attack. Earp murdered a man suspected of being involved just a couple of days later. He then formed a posse with his brothers and friends, including Doc Holliday, and set out on a vendetta, sending Maddie to stay with family in California. It's impossible to know whether this was intended to keep her out of harm's way, or just an easy way to be left in Arizona to pursue his relationship with Sadie. It doesn't matter in the end. Maddie waited in California for a telegram, which never arrived, before eventually setting out again for Arizona territory. Wyatt, now traveling around Colorado and California with Sadie, would not be waiting for her there. Maddie's last interaction with Earp would be the letters they exchanged in the summer of 1882, in which Maddie requested a divorce, as she had taken up with someone new. Wyatt Earp, conman and pimper of women, declined Maddie's request. Why? Because he apparently didn't believe in divorce. By any reading, these seem to be the actions of a man with an almost psychotic need to control women. This need can also be seen in his seemingly innocuous insistence on calling Josephine Marcus Sadie even years after she had gone back to her real pre-tombstone name of Josie. It's almost as if Earp wanted to keep her in her place and asserts some form of dominance over her by calling her only by her prostitute name. Maddie's new man in Arizona soon left her, and her last few years were a bleak slide into oblivion. Sadie, on the other hand, would spend the next 47 years following Earp from Arizona to New Mexico, Colorado, California, Washington State, Alaska and almost every imaginable point in between. They say that water finds its own level. Josephine Sarah Marcus, alias Sadie Mansfield, was no pushover, and certainly no saint. And this is leaving any consideration or moral judgment of her checkered employment history entirely to the side. She had a bad gambling habit, a very bad gambling habit, made worse by being a bad gambler. She had a more than distant relationship with honesty. Most reliable sources agree that both she and Earp engaged in adulterous affairs and had ferocious fights. In-laws and friends of Earp remarked on her almost cruel neglect of her life partner as he became old and frail, even while continuing to trade on his name and reputation. Josephine Marcus certainly knew the American capitalistic monetary value of Earp's ridiculous dime novel reputation as a gunslinging, leather-tough, taciturn exemplar of the great white western lawman. Right up until his and her own death, she aggressively curated his reputation, threatening lawsuits whenever anyone dared to mention Earp's past women, or Earp's drinking, gambling, or lifelong close association with prostitution. But when it came to remembering her own early life in the 1870s, the recollections Josephine Marcus shared with others were always decidedly vague and contradictory, and often simply dishonest. A person might be inclined to suspect that Josephine was as dishonest with herself as she was with others. It is, after all, an age-old survival mechanism.
Part 3 Irreplaceable When a girl fetches up in a brothel in Tombstone, Arizona in the 1880s, there is probably a story behind her. A long story. So what do we know about Josie's and Celia's backstories? Josephine Sarah Marcus was Jewish, through and through. Her father, Carl Hyman Henry Marcus, a follower of the new Reform Judaism being expounded in Prussia, came from a Polish-speaking region which had been absorbed by German Prussia during the 1700s. Her mother, Sophia Louis Levy, seems to have come from Schleswig-Holstein, a German region abutting Denmark and just north of Hamburg, a region which had also been absorbed into the expanding Prussian state. Josie's parents were probably multilingual to some degree, able to get by in Polish, German and English, but with Yiddish as their day-to-day language in the home. By the time Josie first ran away to Arizona, her parents had already travelled over 8,700 miles to reach San Francisco via New York and Panama. While life on the American West Coast was initially an improvement on what they had left behind in New York, Things soon took a turn for the worse, due to the volatility of the Western economy, which was largely based on mining booms. Still, they managed somehow to get by, with various family members working as humble bakers and garment cutters for the clothing industry, and later as accountants. Josie, while by no means devoutly religious, certainly didn't discard her ethnic or religious identity on her life travels. Her partner, Wyatt Earp, seems to have moved in and among the Jewish community of the American West very much at ease, counting the first mayor of Albuquerque, New Mexico, a Jewish man by the name of Henry Jaffa, among his friends. Earp's regular dealings with Jews and his taking up with a Jewish woman caused some consternation to Earp's lifelong buddy Doc Holliday, who eventually accused Earp of turning into a damn Jew boy. This verbal outburst would lead to a falling out between the two men, which would never heal completely. A falling out which never made it into any of the mythological Hollywood portrayals of their friendship. Americans and Hollywood are not alone in their preference for Wild West mythology over historical fact. A new documentary, released only this year, called Jews of the Wild West, was reviewed in June 2022 in the Jerusalem Post. In it, Josephine Marcus's own fictionalized version of her life story is repeated uncritically. She is simply referred to as a Jewish actress. Dear, oh dear. At any rate, fans of the Wild West mythos anywhere in the world would no doubt be surprised to learn that America's most famous gunslinger was eventually laid to rest in a quiet Jewish cemetery in California. As to Celia Ann, Maddie Blaylock, we've already alluded to the tragedy of multiple early deaths in her immediate family. But what do we find when we push farther back in time? The story of Celia Blaylock and her family can be traced right back into the barbarous years of earliest Virginia, a blood-soaked piece of ground for a period of time beyond any normal sense of reckoning. The origins of the Blaylock family before their appearance in Virginia records are unknown. Even the very surname Blaylock is somewhat shrouded in mystery, one of many American surnames with no clear provenance. It sounds vaguely Irish or Scots Gaelic, and a few rare and somewhat similar names are found in the British Isles, but then again, no one really knows. Those who have listened to our third episode, Matrimony and Mayhem, which cast an eye over the earliest days of the Jamestown colony, will be aware of the extraordinary range of ethnic groups who were intermingling in Virginia during the 1600s. And of course, the first and most certain way in early and later American history to get off to a bad start in life was to be born something other than English or white. 
the second best way to get off to a bad start in life was to be born into poverty or during a time of war. The third easiest way to get off to a bad start in life is obviously to be born to bad parents. Bad can obviously mean an infinite number of things. For our purposes here, we'll stick to parents who are borderline sociopaths or criminals. The extremely divided America of today tends to frame every debate as a zero-sum game, in which nuanced discussion is seen as a sign that a person is lacking the courage of their ideological convictions. For example, try using the term transgenerational trauma around certain people, and they tend to go apoplectic, asserting that there is no such thing, that we are all born able to excel if we would only refuse to play the victim. We won't enter into that debate here, except to say this. After over 15 years of daily research, after viewing literally over a million records and compiling a database of tens of thousands of old mix American families, this podcaster can say with the utmost certainty that those people who could pass for white, those who got land grants during the frontier era, those willing to kill for land or resources, those happy to use slave labor or the fruits of slave labor, those with access to education, those with kind, educated, prosperous, well-connected, or ruthless parents, those people are the ones infinitely more likely to have successful descendants alive today. Of course, there will always be exceptions. Those rare people who overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. But most people are not heroes. If we were all heroes, we wouldn't be continually on the lookout for heroes. So, having got that out of the way, let's just say that in American history, each of the aforementioned advantages is like inheriting a treasured tool for our bag as we set off down life's highway. Some people are lucky enough to start off with a full set of top quality tools and maybe even a workshop with a few helpers. Social disadvantage is like having blunt or broken tools, having your tools robbed, or never having any tools or even a tool bag in the first place. Certain families and communities have always been more likely to be starting from zero in this way, with an empty tool bag. Throw some sheer bad luck into the mix. Floods, disease, tornadoes, war injuries, lynchings, illness, epidemics, droughts, and presto. Meet the people most likely to pass trouble or trauma down the generations. Again, this needn't always be so, but it often is, nonetheless. So, back to Celia. The extraordinarily high early mortality rate in Celia's family was not confined to her own generation. One of Celia's great-grandfathers on her mother's side lost both of his parents to a disease epidemic in 1768, aged only 17. But fate was not finished with Celia's great-grandfather. He would perish himself in another disease outbreak 12 years later, aged only 30, along with five of his much younger siblings. These Osborne people were Quakers, a religious group we will revisit again and again in future episodes, and for many reasons. Celia's great-grandfather Osborne appears to have been a first cousin of the noted Quaker abolitionist Charles Osborne, who published the first anti-slavery Gazette newspaper, The Philanthropist, in Indiana in 1817. This early Quaker opposition to slavery was reflected in the many free people of color from numerous ethnic backgrounds who were welcomed into backcountry Quaker meeting houses, where many frontier marriages would be made. Quakerism seems to be a religion that many people dipped a toe into 
before moving on or being asked to leave due to its restrictions on certain behaviors. People like Samuel Bunch, former President Barack Obama's seventh great-grandfather. This is worth bearing in mind when we try to understand the ethnic background of people who seemingly appear out of nowhere in Quaker records with no previous documentary history. Before the Society of Friends, the Quakers, took a clear stance in regard to slavery, some Quakers did in fact hold slaves. But in a frontier setting, it is also worth considering whether many of the early Quaker slaveholders on paper were in fact really slaveholders, or merely people who were married or otherwise related to persons of colour. These people may have made the choice to enumerate actual family members as property in order to circumvent any potential difficulties. Weight is added to the likelihood of non-European or non-white ancestry on this side of Celia's family when we look at her mother's Nance people, with men like Hudson Nance having free people of colour enumerated in his household in 1830s North Carolina. Contrary to the views held by the kind of people who disingenuously claim that white racism died when we freed the slaves over 150 years ago, abolition was never a white savior story in which white people just decided to free the slaves. It is extremely important to acknowledge the actions and agency of the innumerable non-whites who were a huge part of the anti-slavery movement. The fight against slavery was a collaborative effort, fought from multiple angles. Some abolitionists were so active precisely because their own mixed ethnic families were impacted by American race laws, especially the tranche of repressive legislation passed in the aftermath of the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831. One final related and perhaps contentious point. Being anti-slavery does not automatically confer saintly status on anybody in history. There were plenty of multi-ethnic ruffians in early America who were opposed to slavery for obvious reasons of self-preservation as much as any belief in universal human rights and equality. When history is simple, chances are it's not good history. On we go. Celia's little brother Marion, the one who died of tuberculosis, had served just shy of one year on the Union side during the Civil War, when he was wounded and mustered out while still in his teens. He married a year after war's end, still only 18 years of age. His young bride, Ellen Evans, died only four months later. Marion Blaylock passed away three or four years after this tragedy. For a nation founded, expanded, and built on militarism, the reward awaiting underclass veterans has often been little more than a perfunctory thank you for your service. The USA government was usually happy in pre-Civil War years to dole out land grants in return for military service. But when federal land became scarcer as more and more settlers moved west, and as massive land tracts were awarded to or snapped up by railway companies, mining companies, and speculators, the best reward that many veterans could hope for was a service pension of some sort late in life. These pensions were precious as they transformed into a widow's pension upon the death of a veteran husband. Giving away Indian lands had cost the U.S. government relatively little, thus the largesse. Besides, homesteaders were, of course, future taxpayers. But cash pensions from the federal treasury were another thing altogether. The hoops through which often illiterate people were made to jump in order to access a modest pension were often beyond ridiculous. When Celia's father died in his 50s, her mother Betsy, still in her 40s, was left in a difficult financial situation. Her attempts to collect a pension based on her son's war service were fruitless. 
his time on active duty was deemed insufficient, war wounds notwithstanding. Thank you for your service, indeed. Some of Celia's, shall we say, less worthy ancestors are found mostly on her father's side of the family. Both her grandfather, Brewer Blaylock, there's a tongue twister, and great-grandfather George Blaylock were regularly being implicated in or indicted on various charges of theft, including farm equipment and horses, along with other members of their extended family in early 1800s Ohio country. Brewer Blaylock was called after his mother's maiden name and the deep ancestry of Martha Brewer is interesting, to say the least. Martha Brewer's father, Oliver Brewer, was a slaveholder on paper, and her grandfather, George Brewer, married a woman named Sarah Lanier. Before your head starts to spin from all the names and connections, we'll just keep it simple. The Lanier family of Virginia, unusually for most old mix American families, can be traced right back to Jamestown and beyond. In fact, the Laniers can be traced right back to the court of Henry VIII, where they were esteemed foreign court musicians. Old King Henry was a sucker for the exotic, especially the world of the Middle East and Orient, often swanning around his palaces and castles dressed in Ottoman-style robes and headdress. While the Laniers, on the face of it, might simply be seen as a French Protestant family, also known as Huguenots, things are not quite as they appear at first glance. You see, the branch of the Lanier family which ended up in Virginia were intermarried with the Bassano family of Italy, who had also supplied musicians to the English court. And very strong evidence points to the likelihood that these people were in fact what used to be called crypto-Jews, that is to say, Jewish people who had publicly converted to Christianity but practiced Judaism in private. Some people have even argued, convincingly, that one of the Elizabethan members of the Lanier Bassano family, Emilia Lanier, was in fact the Dark Lady of Shakespearean sonnets. Be all that as it may, what is certain is that members of this Lanier family intermarried with members of the Nansemund people in Virginia during the 1600s. These particular Nansemund families were carriers of the Bass surname, which came via their intermarriage with the Bass family of London merchants at Jamestown. It is unclear whether the similarity between the Bass and Bassano surnames is purely coincidental. Many of the Liner families, spelled L-I-N-E-R, found all over Appalachia today, can probably trace a connection to these early multi-ethnic families. Much pre-Revolutionary War genealogy is based on a combination of DNA triangulation, hard scrutiny, and cross-reference of sources, and even educated guesswork. In the mist of colonial times, the people hardest to pinpoint are the people this writer calls sparks. Even the best paper trails fail to take into account the innumerable affairs and infidelities, children born out of wedlock, children born to slaves, consorts and concubines, adoptees, and yes, the children of sporting girls. Even the so-called southern gentleman, Doc Holliday, had an adopted Mexican stepbrother. So maybe Celia was a spark, ultimately untraceable beyond a few generations. But between her complex ethnicity, lack of money, deaths and tragedies, and some dubious family members, maybe, just maybe, we can begin to trace a blurry line from multi-ethnic Jamestown to a bedroom in Penal County, Arizona. Or maybe not. We've given so much more consideration to Celia than Josie, because Celia is the one most forgotten by American mythology. She is the one Josie herself tried to write out of history, and she is the one 
who came out of things the worst. One last word on the white lawman in this story. Remember John Harris Behan, Black-Eyed Johnny? Remember how we mentioned the multi-ethnic nature of early Quaker meeting houses back in the Carolinas and Virginia? Just like Celia Blaylock, some of Johnny's great-grandparents on his mother's side were members of one such Quaker meeting house, and some of their children married into a family with the surname of Bunch. Confused? Don't be. It just means that Johnny Behan has a great-grandfather in common with former President Barack Obama. We were all cousins before we were white. It is perhaps one of the greatest ironies of history that some Americans, a people among the most ethnically mixed of all nations on the planet, should presume to believe in any form of racial or ethnic purity. Even slavery, an institution designed to separate and delineate categories of people, by its very nature, and perhaps also ironically, actually served to keep different ethnic groups close by one another, locked in a cold embrace. Five years ago this month, in 2017, a motley assortment of goons marched through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, carrying tiki torches of all things, one of the ultimate symbols of American forgetfulness of the real places and real cultures which their nation has colonized and plundered. And no, this is not just about the current buzz term, cultural appropriation. It is about the obliteration and replacement of fellow human beings and their rich cultural memory and history with profitable consumerist dream trash, which signifies nothing real. It's hard to culturally appropriate things which were never Hawaiian to begin with. Aloha shirts and tiki torches allow Americans to feel the Hawaiian vibe by inventing the Hawaiian vibe and cashing in on the Hawaiian vibe, but without needing to confront the actual history of how an island chain in the middle of the Pacific Ocean became an American state, just like we invent the Wild West vibe, like we invent the genteel Old Deep South vibe. At any rate, the American president in 2017 noted that many of these tiki torch bearers loudly protesting the removal of Confederate monuments were very fine people. The president didn't say it, but both he and his very fine people are positively steeped in the genteel Old Deep South vibe. Charlottesville is a few thousand miles from Hawaii, the imaginary home of the Tiki Torch. It's also thousands of miles from California, the actual home of the Tiki Torch, and Hollywood. But Charlottesville is just over a hundred miles upriver from Jamestown, Virginia, ground zero for Old Mix America. And over 400 years after the founding of Jamestown, these angry, marching descendants of the impoverished, these descendants of criminals, these descendants of luckless indentured servants, these descendants of a mixed bag of English, Spanish, Portuguese, Nansimons, Armenians, Poles, Pamunkey, Germans, Romani Gypsies, Angolans, Malagasy, Welsh, Potawomac, Scots, Italians, French, Dutch, and Jews, then have the audacity, the sheer brass neck, the utterly unplumbable depth of historical ignorance and blind lack of self-knowledge to dare to speak of the Great Replacement Theory 
in which a so-called white race is being driven to extinction and supplanted by various brown and black peoples, including Jews. You will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. Replace? Uh, sorry boys, but you already are the mixed progeny of the very people you fear and hate. Of course, sharing genes does not mean sharing culture. Culturally, these boys are in a category all their own. This episode of Before We Were White was researched, written, and produced by Brian Halpin. New original recording of the main theme, Molly McAlpine, was performed by Steph West. Stephanie's harp playing is simply sublime. Please do take the time to visit her website at www.stephwest.co.uk. Additional music by Maktira and Ray Cohen. An extra special thanks goes out to Leanne and Pamela this episode, whose early patronage has helped more than they could ever imagine. <laughs>